Joining us uh, now is uh, Rafael Atenconi, uh, senior economist. Uh, Madam, uh, pleasure to have you. Thanks uh, very much uh, for joining us this morning. All right, uh, so an amazing story of transformation here in Poland and uh, the rest of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, about 10 countries uh, joined uh, the EU uh, 20 years ago in 2004, May 1st, um, including Malta and Cyprus. Many people uh, forget the very small islands, but uh, they also benefited uh, from membership. But let's concentrate on Poland. Uh, tell us, uh, in the numbers, how has Poland benefited uh, from EU accession? Good morning, everyone, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you today. Happy 1st of May. Thanks Look, very much. All, <laughs> all member states uh, have enormously gained in terms of increased openness to trade. Poland has been definitely one of the most successful, which was not an easy task because Poland is a, is a big country. So trade openness, uh, you know, has more than doubled uh, since entering 2004. And what has that done is has brought in skills, new technologies, new uh, new industries, uh, more complicated regulation definitely to be aligned with the EU, but that has laid the foundation essentially to bring Poland from a, a very poor, high unemployment country uh, at the beginning of 2000 to be one of the biggest countries in the EU. In fact, we think it will hit 1 trillion euros within a few years. So it will be in the top five in the EU. Uh, wage gains across the income distribution have significantly improved and actually comparable now even to Italy in, uh, in the middle segment and to higher segment. So I would say it has been transformative on many levels. And overall, I would judge it as definitely a success. And uh, speaking now of of uh, these, uh, let's say, um, uh, what what we have achieved so far, what Poland has achieved so far, um, what do you think now contributed to that? Is it just EU funds, or is it, let's say, other factors that have contributed to to this phenomenon? No, I think when you look at the EU project, there are more nuanced issues. Of course, the EU funds. Uh, is the special part of the European Union in the sense that you were able to fund critical infrastructure like motorways as well as other critical infrastructure in an easier way uh, than any other countries that is not inside of the EU. So that, and that is very visible because EU funds are three, four percent of GDP a year when you're in, especially in the case of Eastern Europe. But don't underestimate that entry into the single market. You know, the EU single market is 450 million people, is the largest uh, in the developed world. And so that has allowed skill transfer. Uh, also access to capital at the beginning of uh, the accession process, which was necessary to develop uh, many other things. So I would say it is, it is the institutional setup, which is now in the single market, it has become more sophisticated, more transferable globally. That is the essential ingredient of the success in the long term. All right, uh, and uh, I mentioned this before, uh, a, a, very, a very simple wisdom is the fact that if you want to stand out, you must first fit in. Um, now, do you think that Poland uh, over these 20 years has reached the, the fit in stage? Um, and hence, uh, you know, and also among other uh, CE regions, uh, there's this kind of fatigue. Uh, they're looking uh, for the next stage and uh, they're looking outside the EU. They're looking in various places. Um, do you think it's a result of the fact that uh, most of the gains that were meant to be made in fitting in have already been made? And now we're looking towards the future, looking for other gains. So you asked me a very complicated question in, in two parts, de facto. The first part about fit in, it's true in the sense that in the modern society where multinationals are enormous part of global trade, being inside the European market allows you access, regulation, knowledge transfer and allows easier commercial ties that allow you to fit in, integrate well into the vertical 
uh, supply chains globally and therefore you grow faster uh, with less external shocks and you can gain more from wage convergence. So the fit in part is important. Now the fatigue, now let's be honest, the European Union is large, right? I mean, 27 member states, everyone has a seat at the table, everyone has veto power in the critical decision. So there is an enormous amount of negotiation and lobbying and research that needs to happen, which is much bigger than any administration of a national government. So that's where the fatigue, that's where the not understanding why I have to do all of this comes through. But that is, first of all, the safety net. You know you're part of the club. And like any club, if you want to be a leader, you need to put the effort in it. So that, I think, is the opportunity and the downside. And in terms of whether you've run out of options, I wouldn't say so. But I would say so that Poland, when entered the EU, was clearly emerging, right? So it had a lot of copying and integrating and learning things. And within a few years, it's going to be in the leadership phase. So it will also be up to Poland's ability to negotiate and vision to push the whole EU forward. So I think it, I mean, from my point of view, is going to become more exciting, but certainly not simpler. Well, you're absolutely right that uh, probably this situation might become a bit more complicated. But one thing is certain is that when it comes to um, now trade and economics as such, now Poland is increasing its impo importance in this sphere. Now let's uh, delve into Poland's current position within the EU landscape and the challenges that it faces. So when do you, what do you think um, we can expect in terms of future developments, um, particularly um, considering the recent influx of funds from the EU Recovery and Resilience Funds. What do you think of this? So I think if you talk about the very near term, so the next few months and this year, uh, I mean, Poland is most likely still uh, an outlier, as in it's one of the best growth stories in the European Union, but it's not going to grow very much because globally exports and especially EU exports are quite stagnant. So the economy is slowly seeing consumption improvement but, and EU fund beginning to flow in even faster, but exports are dragging on growth. For next year, I think you could definitely aim to see growth in the 4 or 5% range if the global economy is also supportive, because then you will see investment, consumption and exports all uh, you know, rising rapidly as well as probably lower, lower rates. So I would say the near term maybe is a little bit underwhelming, but the long term is still is still very compelling. All right. Uh, and, and I wonder, uh, we're talking in the economics. I mean, the idea of the European Union was, was basically economic, but there's more and more politics uh, involved um, in the European Union. And this seems to be um, discouraging some people, uh, especially uh, we see the emergence of uh, right-wing populism, and not just um, here in this region, but also in the West. We see it, we see it everywhere, and we see it in Spain, in Italy, in France. Um, we, we were seeing a lot of it in, in the Netherlands. Um, I wonder, what's, what's going on here? Um, are, are the states and the EU starting to work across purposes? So the EU project is sold as an economic project. And it's true that the single market and the wage convergence process are so powerful that that is what stands out initially. But when you look at surveys, for example, if you look at the Eurobarometer, which is standardized across 28, uh, 27 member states, you know, people consistently say that the EU is primarily cherished because of protects democracy, human rights and peace. These three are always the top, right? So it is for voters, it's primarily its social and institutional aspect that it's most important and it's the one that it's quite cumbersome to push forward. Now, you'd rightly said that people are getting um, upset with the complexity of the politics and disillusioned, even though 
the times are good in the EU, right? The unemployment rate is very is very low and GDP is not strong, but it's not falling. I think that is not the problem of the EU. That is probably the problem of my own profession, economics, because what we see is that there is a growing disparity between what the GDP number would say and what is the reality across the income distribution and across people of different genders or different professions. And at this stage, we have not evolved enough to really pay enough attention to these differences. And this is true in inflation. People's perception of inflation has been consistently much higher than measured inflation. People's perception about their own uh, growth and wage dynamic has been distant relative to what GDP looks. And it also looks when you when you think about spending in the public sector, you know, there are certain goods that make a huge difference if you're going private or if you're going public in terms of quality, but also in terms of, of price. So this disillusionment that you see in East and in the West has the same root. And I think it has to do with the fact that a more global world, a more digital world, is a world that tends to be more deceptive in the average. So the more extreme are the income distribution, the harder it is for the average to capture the reality of each people, right? So we have not adapted yet to this new reality, but I don't think the EU is a negative in adapting this. I think the EU requires each member state to lobby and to recognize the importance of these differences and then to adapt. All right, so we have the question of perception and then, of course, adaptation. Um, and perception, unfortunately, uh, we have uh, the powers uh, a little bit further east of here that are quite involved in creating uh, various perceptions that exist in uh, Europe as well, unfortunately. Well, and uh, so thank you so much for joining us and for your insights into the subject. Thank you.